All right. <clears throat> Does anyone need a handout? Does anyone need a handout? Everyone good? Everyone good? The answer is no, you're totally depraved. Okay? Uh, good news tonight, Brother Don. We're going to cover one, two, three, four, five, six verses. Hopefully we'll get done before you pass on to glory. Okay? So we're excited. Go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm excited about tonight, man. When you get there, say a word. We're going to read verses 26 through 31. This is God's word. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. May God bless the reading of his word. Tonight, we're going to talk about being created in the image of God. Yes. Okay. Being created in the image of God. And if you haven't been with us a whole lot during Genesis chapter 1, one of the things we've seen constantly is that Genesis chapter 1 is a argument against the pagan gods of Egypt. Let me explain why. All of the Jews and Moses were coming out of slavery in Egypt. They had been living in Egypt for hundreds of years, been slaves for a very long time, and had been inundated with the polytheistic, that means many god, paganism, that means uh, a little bit of a culmination of naturalistic universalism combined with... Think of Buddhism, how everything is intertwined naturally, etc., etc., etc. They've been inundated with polytheistic paganism for hundreds of years. And so when they were delivered out into the desert, they were delivered from Egypt through the Exodus out into the desert, God goes up on the mountain... Uh, Moses goes on the mountain, he meets with God. Over that period of time in the desert, God reveals to Moses the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Moses was composing the Pentateuch after the Exodus. And he's writing the history of God's people. And one of the things that stands out so starkly supreme in Genesis chapter 1 is that this God is unlike any other uh, of the Egyptian myths that there is one supreme God who rules everything, if you agree, say amen. So I'm not going through all that again. Tonight we'll get a little bit of that because we're talking about what it means to be created in the image of God. So Genesis 1 is an argument against the gods of polytheistic Egypt. And Genesis 1 distinguishes God as the sole source of everything. He alone is in sovereign rulership. Therefore, for man to be created in the image of God, man then is distinctly separate from the gods of Egyptian mythology. Meaning, God is saying, I'm going to create man in the image which I am reflecting in creation, not the image which they think God is like. 
Because the reason the Bible was written was to tell us what God is like because we don't properly know what God is like. If we knew what God is like, we, we wouldn't have to have the Bible. So God is going to say, I'm going to tell you what I'm like, and I'm unlike all those gods that you've heard about for hundreds of years. So, in Genesis chapter 1, we learn that God is purposeful. That he does things with a plan. He does not act haphazardly. He does not act randomly. He does not do things uh, simply for vanity. He does them with a purpose. If the gods of paganism acted out of anger or pleasure, then the opposite of that would be man should act with function and purpose like God. Meaning, man should not just do things on a whim. For us to be created in the image of God means we do things structurally. We do things orderly. We do things, I'm sorry, we do things purposefully because there is a function to what we're doing or at least this is how Adam was created so for example uh, when we say is it beneficial to spend all day watching Netflix we have to look well what did God create us to be is that purposeful is that going to accomplish something right is it beneficial to spend all day uh, playing the video games well is that purposeful is that accomplishing anything is there something that we could be doing that would have a function rather than our sheer entertainment and one of the things we see is that God did not create man to be entertained he created man to accomplish something and to fulfill something so the garden wasn't just Adam chilling right it was him ruling it, subduing it, and continuing the functionality which God gave to him. So, we see that God is purposeful in how he has acted and how he's structured and how he's ordered. Secondly, we see that God is benevolent. Benevolent means he acts out of kindness towards others and not selfish pleasure. If the gods of paganism are self-seeking in their efforts, then man should be selfless, right? Let's think about the pagan gods. Pagan gods are always uh, trying to get their own uh, craving accomplished, right? So, so for example, one of the, you, you remember when I talked about the, um, the fertility gods, right? Why did the fertility gods, why did they construct... Uh, temples to the fertility gods and have prostitutes because they believed that fulfilling uh, craving was the way that gods operated and so the way you worship the gods of fertility was to go into the temple and be with the prostitutes because they think that gods operate that way and actually we see that paganism these concepts carry throughout the rest of the earth that pagan philosophy, polytheistic philosophy, always associates the gods with seeking to satisfy their personal agendas. But Elohim, the God of the Bible, is unlike those gods. He doesn't seek to satisfy a craving. He seeks to bless and give himself to others. That's benevolence. Benevolence is the giving of oneself for other people. God did not create man so that man could provide for God's needs, right? Why in uh, uh, pagan religions are they sacrificing, you know, we see in the, the Bible that they were sacrificing children. Why were they doing that? They believed that the gods fed on children. Why were they uh, burning people? Why would they sacrifice people as a literal burnt sacrifice because they believe the gods wanted to consume that's how they that's how they fed themselves Roman here's your Bible son okay all right Elohim does not act that way 
And actually, you'll say, well, well, what about the systems of offerings in the Old Testament? The systems or offerings were not to feed God. In Egyptian uh, temples and pyramids, they would go make food offerings to the idol or to the image because they believed that their food offering was somehow feeding the image. Never do we see God saying that he's hungry. Never do we see God saying that he's thirsty and so we need to bring him a wine offering. Right? So the system of Egyptian polytheistic worship is nothing like the system of worship in the Old Testament. God does not act because of his own selfish need. God acts because of his glory and because he is sharing his glory with others. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask at any time, okay? <clears throat> Don normally starts us off about halfway through. All right. Or Holly. Okay. We see that God is ordered. Meaning, he has a system, and he has a design. And therefore, creation reflects his design. Everything we see in the six days of creation, how he does things, he does things orderly and not haphazardly. So that means when we do things, like for example... Um, Today you, you went to work, and then you're going to come home, then you're going to have dinner, and then you're going to put on your pajamas. You don't wake up in the morning, have a shower, and put on your pajamas. Unless you're retired and you can do whatever you want. And honestly, in that system, it makes sense. But <clears throat> if I came to work in my pajamas, Scarlett would say, Pastor, are you okay? Because that would not be in order, right? So God created us to reflect in order. Uh, we're going to do things in the sequence they should occur. occur. We're going to build a house by laying the foundation and then setting the floor and then setting the walls. When we do that, you know, we're identifying with God's logical order because that's how God operates. God installed boundaries to instill order in the cosmos. Every day we saw that God divided something. He divided the water uh, below from the water above. He divided the land so that the water, this ocean over here, would be over here. He divided the uh, creeping animals from the walking animals. God was dividing things to make order. And we're supposed to continue that order. Uh, now here's the thing. If you lose order in the universe, meaning if you lose the division of things, then you also lose morality and truth. Let me explain that. For example, what did God do on day six? He created them male and female. That means God divided things. He said, this is one thing, this is another thing. When you deny order, and you deny division, you lose truth. When we say that there is no such thing as male or female, there's no such thing as division, then we have broken down the foundation of God's order in the universe. And so what we're seeing in our culture today is a rejection of God's order because if you can reject God's order, then you can also reject morality. And if you can claim that uh, the God of the Bible is, is myth or, or uh, folklore, then you don't have to be held accountable to a moral standard and you can do whatever you want. I did not watch the Academy Awards. Uh, I, and I'm not judging you if you did. I imagine some people did. I heard there was a movie that got a, a lot of acclaim. And in this movie, the movie is about a grown man having an intimate relationship with a 17-year-old boy. Have y'all heard of this? 
Does anybody know the name of what that movie was? Call Me, yeah, Call Me By Your Name. I heard Al Mohler talking about this. And this got rave reviews from the, the Academy, meaning the, the, the highest up people in Hollywood gave this rave reviews for a grown man seeking a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old minor. You know why Hollywood celebrates that? Because Hollywood has no moral foundation for truth. And they reject it everywhere. I posted something the other day. I'll share it with you guys. Someone got not, not upset with me, but, but called me out on it. Harvard University banned a Christian organization because one of their leaders, who is a female, was dating another female. So the Christian organization says, hey, you can't be a leader in this ministry if you're a female dating a female. And the university banned them, or excuse me, put them on probation for not tolerating the sexual discrimination policy of the university. And someone said, well, they really didn't ban Christian organizations. I said, okay, they just banned the ones that follow the Bible. Right? I mean, you can be a Christian organization as long as you don't follow the Bible. But if you follow the Bible, you can't be here. To me, that's banning Christian organizations. All right? And why does that happen? Because it rejects God's order. I was listening to a great sermon by John Piper. He says, when God desired to create a helper for Adam, he did not make another man. He made a woman. He did not make another man. And so either, either we will find truth in what God has said, or it will be up in the air to whether, whatever we think is likable. Right? God also is rational. He operates with reason and logic. If the gods of paganism operate based on their own personal agenda then man should act based on what God has revealed and not what he thinks is beneficial. What does it mean to be rational? It means to operate with reason. Reason deals with knowledge as we can comprehend knowledge. Last night we were having our, our devotional in our family, and uh, I asked Bella and I asked Roman, I said, what is uh, wisdom? And what we talked about from uh, Proverbs is that wisdom is the application of knowledge. Okay? So, knowledge, you can know something, but if you don't know how to apply it, you don't... There's a lot of people who are smart, but have no wisdom. But wisdom is how to apply knowledge. And so, rational, meaning to be rational, means you take knowledge and you understand how to do something with it. All right. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then God is moral, which means he determines what's right and wrong. Uh, morality is moral because God said it's moral. Because he is the standard. One of my favorite things to talk to with atheists is they'll say, well, I don't believe God would allow so much evil. So I don't believe in God. I'm like, wait a minute, you just assumed my worldview by claiming the world is evil. Because if you don't believe in God, then nothing's evil. Because there's no lawgiver and there's no law and there's no right or wrong. So how can you say there's evil in the world if you don't even believe that there's a moral standard? So they've assumed a moral standard, and, I, and then what I say is, where do you get your moral standard? to determine what's evil. Who tells you what's evil? And then they'll either say society or genetic evolution and blah, blah, blah. All of those break down because, listen, if, if uh, uh, society says it's okay to, uh, to kill Jews, then guess what? It's moral. If a society says it's okay to be cannibals, guess what? It's moral. So there can be no other convention for morality except for a divine, metaphysical, transcendent truth that comes from God. 
So God is moral. He determines what's right and what's wrong because he is the moral lawgiver. Now, as I was researching this passage, and I'm contemplating, I'm asking the question, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? I see that God gave man five instructions. And these instructions are, are what we read here in verse 28. Go to verse 28 with me. We'll count these together. The first instruction is be fruitful and multiply. The second instruction is to fill the earth. The third instruction is subdue the earth. The fourth destru- uh, instruction is to have dominion over the fish of the sea and everything on the earth. And then the fifth instruction is in verse 29, I have given you every herb that yields seed in fruit who yields seed for food. So the fifth instruction is to partake of the seed bearing food. And as I was looking at these things, I asked myself the question, do the five instructions given to man correlate with what we understand about God in Genesis chapter 1? So as God has revealed himself, do these instructions correlate with how God has revealed himself? And I believe they do. I believe that the five instructions are actually pictures of what God was doing. And so God says, this is what I have done. Now I'm going to let you do it. Let's examine these. He says, be fruitful and multiply. That means to do something with purpose. That means to have a, have a goal. As we've mentioned, Genesis chapter 1 is about God bringing function to the chaos. The opening verses, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, verse 2, the earth was without form, a void, darkness. It wasn't producing anything. So God brought purpose to the cosmos the chaos wasn't doing anything so God makes the chaos produce something and now God tasks man with taking part in the divine design by doing that which will continue to be fruitful so if God made the earth to be fruitful then God tells man you be fruitful so almost like God is God is saying I've made the earth to be fruitful Now I'm going to make you to be fruitful. And you're going to identify with the pattern that I've instilled in creation because creation is doing something. So so here's our question, okay? Whenever we we make a decision, we ask ourselves, is this fruitful? Is this beneficial? Is this going to produce something that God wants? You know? When you really want to just smack your neighbor in the mouth, just ask yourself, is this fruitful? Sometimes the answer might be yes, but I'm not going to be the judge of that. Is this fruitful? And every question that we have, is it fruitful? Is it fruitful? Will it bear fruit? Right? Will it continue producing what God wants? So be fruitful. Also, multiply. I'm not going to go into great detail here. My son's Romans here. He's five. He'll learn it one day. Roman, you're a product of that, son. He doesn't care. He's he's zoned out. Okay? Be fruitful and multiply. That means continue carrying forth God's design of producing in the earth. Continue carrying forth. (laughs) But that's where we subdue it. Don't get ahead of me, D. I do agree with you. And that's a, that's a result of the fall. That's a good point. Okay. Secondly, he says, fill the earth. God's pinnacle of creation is man. He established man in order to bring humanity into all creation. He wants to bring humanity into every part of creation to govern it. So that means that, that Adam must act with the rest of humanity in mind. Adam can't just say, hey, I want to go cliff diving. 
This looks fun. <laughs> Pull a wily coyote, right? He can't just, he can't be self-destructive. He can't be self-absorbed. He can't say, hey, I don't think I'm going to plow the field this year. Uh, I'm good. Die. He can't do that. That won't fill the earth. So he has to act with other people in mind. He has to act with the rest of the... Every decision he has to make, he's saying, is this going to help fill the earth? That means he has to be benevolent. He has to be other-centered, not self-centered. He has to have all his offspring, all his lineage, all of the rest of humanity in mind so that God's mandate will be carried forth. He must do what's good for others, not just for himself. Thirdly, he must subdue the earth. Let's see what your translation says. Uh, oh, subdue it. Anyone else have something different? It's right after fill the earth and... Does everyone say subdue? Okay, it's pretty, pretty common word across the board. That means bring it under control. So, so Dean, with all the little chaos running around, I have to subdue the chaos. Right? That means whoop the chaos. Amen. Put the chaos and time out. Bring it in function. Make it operate properly. Now the word subdue resonates with what we talked about, the Hebrew word create, which means to take chaos and bring it under control. All right? Now what picture do we get here? We get the picture here. Listen, Adam, if you're going to have to subdue the earth, that means I'm not giving you something that you can just coast through. I'm not giving you something that you can just be hands off whatever you want. So I'm going to ask you this question. When God tells Adam to subdue the earth, meaning bringing it under control, that means that it could still get out of control. What do you think God had in mind there? Now, now God said everything was good, right? Everything was good. Why would, it, why would a good thing possibly get out of control? Yes, Holly. Wait a minute, say that again. Others. Yes. Not necessarily. Not necessarily because I'm going to talk about pleasure on the last part. Okay? So enjoyment is proper when it's done morally. So pleasure is proper when it's moral pleasure. And I want you to hold that thought for when we get to point five. Okay. Do you want to potentially answer the question from number three? What did God have in mind when he said to subdue it? What do you think God had in mind? Everything needs order? Okay, that's true. God had already brought order to it. But why would he tell, why would he tell Adam to subdue it if it's all good? What? Well, because God established an ordered system. And so, what does that mean then that Adam would have to do to subdue it? So, so, yeah, let me say this uh, for the video. What you're saying is that an example of, of man subduing the earth is uh, the domestic, domestication of farm animals. Uh, that we used uh, horses for travel and, and uh, mules or donkeys for the plow. All of those things is us taking something. It, you know what? The, the horse, when it's out there running through the forest, it's good. But we subdue it, and guess what we did? We made it functional. Right? Right. Do you think... <laughs> I wonder if making Bojangle chicken is an example of that. No, not yet. Not yet. 
Okay. Amen, George. I mean, praise the Lord. Raise them up. That's their purpose. Get in my belly. Right? Put a little Cajun on it. Oh, that's good. Uh, so that's good. So, so Adam had to bring it into function because it potentially would have gone out of control if he didn't subdue everything. Dave, did you have something to add to that? Yes. For example, God gave Adam a tree, or I'm saying mankind. God gave mankind a tree, and at some point, mankind cut down the tree and, and hewn that into logs and made a house. He subdued creation. Or he took that tree and he made a boat. Or he took that... Uh, deer skin and made a hat or whatever it was and we're still in the process of subduing creation right I mean what's something naturally that we have to subdue oh let's say wind power we take something and we harness it to make it functional down in Midland they're putting in a 600 acre solar farm 600 acre solar farm. So they're taking something and they're causing it to be functional. That's an example of that. Right? It's good. Okay. Uh, fourthly, we were tasked with ruling over the earth. And that means we have to be rational. Rationality, as I said, means to operate with knowledge. And knowledge can only be discerned based upon what God has said. There is no other knowledge, and I'm talking about rational knowledge of government. There is no way to discern what is proper apart from God's revelation. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. That doesn't mean that I think that every government in the world is a Christian government. It certainly is not. But that does mean that they're governing based on standards of morality that have come from God. And God is the only source of those standards. God is the only source of those laws. Actually, half of the Old Testament is God telling people how to govern themselves. And most of the civilizations in the Western world have s s systems of government that are based on what God has said. And because He is bringing all things under the feet of Jesus, eventually we see that governments everywhere begin reflecting what God has said. What does it mean to be rational, to rule over the earth? It means to have dominion over it. Actually, I think the New King James says, have dominion. It means to govern it. How do we govern it? We govern it, A, by continue with the systems of division that God has installed. Okay? If you are tasked with governing uh, track and field, you're supposed to be the auditor for track and field. Well, they put lanes there that each runner has to run in the lane. How do you govern that? Because there's a division there that you have to maintain. If you let this runner cut across the field and jump over here, and you don't govern that, then you've not kept a boundary that was already there. So to govern means to keep the boundaries that God has set. All right. Now, let's talk about your question. Excellent question, Holly. Does that mean that there was no pleasure in the garden? And what we assume there is that pleasure is always self-seeking, but not necessarily so because God says, I've given you everything for food. Humans need fuel. And God has designed us where we like food. And so when we eat, it's good. And it tastes good. And so when Adam was there, 
sauteing his eggplant, roasting up his cabbage because actually he wasn't eating animals yet. But when he was there harvesting the greens and, and harvesting the potatoes, he might have put some Cajun seasoning on them potatoes. I don't know. But you make a big bowl of soup, it was for his enjoyment. But that enjoyment was to be rightly done in the setting that God had said this is allowable. So morality, morality is the ability to find pleasure in appropriate things. And what is immoral is taking pleasure in what is not appropriate. God is perfectly content with creating a system where Adam delighted in his experience and delighted in God. If you'll remember my message on Psalm 119, the reason we delight in God is because we are satisfied in God. The reason we take pleasure in God is because God is actually the best thing for us. So... I believe Adam found pleasure in every seed-bearing fruit and seed-bearing herb, but we know the story, when he tried to found, find pleasure in what was not appropriate, that is sin. So morality is being able to discern what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Morality acts based on what is right and wrong and does not consult feelings. Right? The big thing in our culture today about the marriage debate is people say, well, love is love, is love, is love. And I want to say some not very nice things, but I, I, I have to be fruitful. But who determines what love is? Um, exactly. I mean, who gave you your definition of love? Where do you get it from? Chemical reaction? The chaos? No, love is what God has said love is. And love is not all about you being pleased. Actually, agape love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, is not self-seeking. It's the laying down of our own self for the honor of another. So, um, I hope this has made sense tonight. But what I wanted to do was connect God as he's been revealed in Genesis 1 with the task that he's given man to carry on. Now, the thing is, Adam failed. Adam did not do all of these things. When he sinned and ate from the tree the knowledge of good and evil. It was not fruitful. It was not benevolent. It was not ordered. It was not rational. And it was not moral. So sin was a denial of his God-given jobs. He didn't do his job. You had one job. Right? And you broke it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But, when we see Jesus, Jesus did every one of these perfectly. Jesus fulfilled the duty of Adam without ever having error. And that's why the first Adam failed. The last Adam succeeded. The last Adam conquered death, hell, and the grave because he kept these instructions perfectly. Any questions before we close? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that Jesus was our perfect Adam. That in the first Adam we fell because...